All right. Hey, guys, welcome to Crossroads. It's great to be with you. My name is James. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we're just excited for the morning ahead. We believe that meeting Jesus, that he changes lives. And if you're here, we believe that he's doing something in your life, and we would love to join you in that. Maybe you're new. Maybe you're checking us out today. We would even like to meet you in that. And the way that you can help us is you can shoot us a text at any time. You can text this number, 720 513 1933. Text the keyword new. And if you have any questions, maybe a specific need, we would love to meet you in that. Well, uh, Jesus does change lives. And we started out our service at 830 with a baptism with Casey and Morgan. Here's their story. Two beautiful daughters and one grandson. My name is Morgan Lambeth. And I've been coming to Crossroads for almost a year now. I've been a skeptical person, I guess. I never really wanted to put a name to who and what I believed in um, until I came here. I was guided here. And yes, maybe it took this long, but it's never too late to find Jesus and to start loving yourself and believing. A little over a year ago, last April, I had lost my grandson and I became lost. And after that, everything kind of started tumbling in our lives, financially, just family-wise. I think it was the hardest time of my life. Um, I was going through a lot and I mean with the passing and even just like going through school and even my own like personal and social issues it just it wasn't a good place at all. I think I really met Jesus when I went on um, a winter retreat. That was just it was such a beautiful moment that I was just like this is where I belong. This is something that I've been like searching for and waiting for all of my life. And so when I when I met Jesus, I basically asked him to save me from everything that was happening that wasn't good. Where I'm at, you know, I've been guided here. It's because of Jesus. He's brought in us here being through this tragedy in our lives. I would say just believe and have faith in Jesus because he will guide you even when you think that there is nothing that is going to help there's going to be nobody there and life's not going to get better it will I want to be baptized because I believe that Jesus is my savior and he knows exactly what I'm going to do and be in the future and for my life my name is Morgan, and I am committing my heart, mind, and soul to Jesus. I am Cassie, and I am committing my mind, heart, and soul to Jesus. Yes, indeed. Cassie, it's because of your testimony of saving faith in Jesus that I joyfully baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Be 
Thinking that you'll never be right Even though your mama praying for you every night Praying Jesus gonna find you and open your eyes Well, maybe right now is that time Like a thief in the night He'll sneak in, take your life That resurrection's gonna have you singing I got stolen by the grave robber Pick me up from that rock bottom Wash my soul in that holy water Brought me back to life one more stone rolled away, one more sinner been saved by grace. This dead man, he ain't dead no longer, all because of that grave robber. Taking my sin, taking my shame, breaking my soul out of these chains. I'm a dead man living. see you here today and what we just experienced together is why we do what we do here at Crossroads Church to see Jesus move in people's lives transforming them from the inside out and it has been an incredible joy and just totally exciting to watch Cassie and Morgan come here about a year ago really far away from Jesus and just moving as he draw them in and now that we get to see and celebrate the new life that they have in him to the point that they're in this tub right getting baptized identifying with his death, burial, and resurrection. So can we just give it up for Jesus and uh, what he's moving and moving? If you're here today and you're like, man, I want to do that too. Like, that's me. That's where I'm at. Um, we would love to walk with you in that. That's what baptism is all about, is identifying with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That in the water, we're pushing you down into the water, saying, I'm dying to myself. And when we pull you up out of the water, it is in the hope that we have of the resurrected life of Jesus. And so, if you're interested in going down that road with us and, um, and professing your faith in that way, we would love to have that conversation. The easiest way for you to connect is simply by using the text number. James mentioned it earlier, 720-513-1933. And you can just use the keyword baptism. So just do baptism to that. We'll get your information that way and we'll start to walk that road. Or today, if you want to stop by the wall that says Jesus on your way out and talk to one of the people there, uh, that's another way that you can start to have the conversation about what baptism could look like in your life. All right? So if you're interested in it, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, take one of those options and go that way. Um, before we get too far into this, I just want to welcome uh, those of you who probably maybe be uh, brand new today. Uh, maybe you came here with a friend. Maybe you're here because of the patio party that's going on and all the candy that's going, uh, going out of here. But we are grateful uh, that you are here today. And if we haven't had the privilege of meeting, my name is Matt Manning. I'm the senior pastor here at Crossroads Church. And I'm grateful that you're here today. Um, today we are actually starting a brand new sermon series called God and Country where we're going to talk about politics. 
All right, yeah, yeah, you're excited. Okay, good, good, good. I, that's, how, that's what I expected the, the, uh, <laughs> the response to be. The reality is, the reality is, is that for as long as there has been people, and as long as we have been a nation or a country, uh, people have struggled to know how to come to terms with both their faith and their politics. Like, how do those two things work together? And for me, um, one of the, um, I would say, like, frustrating experiences that I've had in my life as a senior pastor is that the craziest thing happens at any time I mention a political figure, specifically a president. Now, I haven't done it very often, but any time I mention a president, whether it be Bush or Obama or Trump or Biden, doesn't matter who. And, you know, the only time I ever mention them is because, you know, like, we all know them and because they're presidents. And any time I do, I'm so careful not to let anybody know, like, am I for them or against them? Any, I just mention them because they're known. And yet the craziest thing that happens is every time I mention a president, not just like one or two emails, but like dozens of emails get sent to me. And you would think on both sides, and you would think that I was up here like campaigning with campaign signs and everything else. And what that experience has taught me is that when it comes to the political realm, that politics are not an emotionally neutral topic, are they? Like this arena is not for the is not for the faint of hearts. And so show of hands, we're gonna take a quick poll. It's election season, let's take a quick poll. Show of hands. How many of you would say that politically it is as bad as it's ever been? Just show your hands. Politically as bad as well, look around. Look at how many people have raised their hands. Like a lot of people feel that way. Certainly in this room, certainly watching online in our community. And so I just want to, as we kind of begin, to kind of ease your heart a little bit and to tell you why it feels awful, while it feels awful to us today, what we're seeing has actually been repeated a lot in our history. Uh, anyone who has seen the musical Alexander Hamilton knows that kind of the culmination of that musical is when Alexander Hamilton is killed by Aaron Burr, who at the time was what? Yes, the sitting vice president of the United States. Like, this isn't just a musical, this is our history. Like, we had a duel between the vice president and one of the founding fathers that ended in murder. Uh, for those, anybody who is a political history kind of interested person, uh, you may be familiar with what happened in May of 1856 in the halls of Congress. Uh, our country was heading towards, uh, was on the brink of civil war, and Charles Sumner, a a uh, congressman from the North got up. He gave a passionate speech on the evils of slavery. And when he was finished, his, when he finished his speech, Preston Brooks, a congressman from the South, ran towards Sumner and beat him to the very edge of death. In history, it is recorded for us as the breakdown of civil discourse. I would say so, Right? That as bad as it is, at least right now, we don't have duels to the death, and we do not have in the halls of Congress literal beatings happening among congressmen. And yet at the same time, it's hard not to feel the tension surrounding politics in our nation right now. That our culture is divided and polarized on almost every single issue, and it feels like it is becoming worse by the day. That every day, if you read or watch the news, every single day, the headlines of the political headlines are front and center, particularly these last few months as we've gotten closer to the presidential election. And the political de debates have crescendoed to what feels like all-time highs around the, uh, around the issues of abortion, uh, immigration policy, inflation, abuse of executive orders, packing the Supreme Court. We have a relatively new department in Homeland Security. You may not know this, but it's a new department. Literally, it is called the Ministry of Disinformation. Sounds like something right out of Harry Potter, doesn't it? We have the Russian-Ukraine war, the powder keg that is the Middle East, not one but two assassination attempts in the last three months, inflammatory language on both sides, both parties telling us and framing this election as a fight for democracy. Like, there is a lot going on politically right now in our nation. And for most of us, for most of us, we're thinking about these things. For most of us, we're having conversations around these issues as the election approaches. And yet in church world, when it comes to church world, this is an area that we don't venture much into. And part of the reason is because we know how charged emotionally this can become. 
and how devastating it can be when it comes to the unity of the church. And so, as the election approaches in just 10 days, and with all of that kind of as the background, we decided, you know what? It might be a good idea to talk about politics in church and to bring this issue front and center. Now, as we begin this series, I just kind of want to want you to know a few things up at the top. That as we begin this series, I, if you've been a part of Crossroads, you've heard this before, but we are a very politically diverse uh, congregation, a very politically diverse church. That about 40% or so of the people here lean Republican, about 30% Democrat, and about 30% Independents. And what brings us together every week, the reason that we unify is not around a political party, but rather we unify around the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the transforming work that he is doing in our lives. That's why we unify as a church. And so when it comes to this series, I want you to know that our aim is not to tell you how to vote. That if you showed up today thinking that I was going to give an endorsement for a particular candidate, you ended up in the wrong place. We are not going to tell you how to vote during this series. But rather, our aim is to address the realities of politics from the foundation of our faith. That's our aim. That our aim is to address the realities of politics from a foundation of our faith. What does it look like for our faith to work together when it comes to our politics? That's where we're moving in this series. And so the issues that we're going to address are these. Week one today, we're going to talk about how do you choose when you don't know what choice to make. Seems pretty relevant today. Then week two, week two, we are going to talk about how do we deal with anxiety? How do we deal with the anxiety of our lives? In a snapshot of American politics, in a 2024 uh, Pew poll done earlier this year, they found that a full 65%, 65% of Americans are often or always distressed by politics. And that 55% are always or often feel angry when it comes to politics. The most recent study just finished up last week shows that the distress that we feel around politics is starting to harm both our physical and mental health. And it's only getting worse where political anxiety is now categorized in medical professions as chronic stress. Like we are literally killing ourselves when it comes to the anxiety and stress we feel politically. Week three, we are going to talk about how the election is over right? And now what do we do? What does it look like to be political, to be a Christian in the world in which we will then live? And then week four, we're going to talk about the sovereignty of God. And we have a very special service planned. You're not going to miss that day as we experience together and remind ourselves of the sovereignty of God in this world. And so that's where we're going to go over these four weeks. And so today we're going to begin, we're going to begin to how to make a choice. How do we make a choice when you don't know what choice to make? That as we look back through the history of the early church, it was primarily four things, primarily four things that separated the church from the world as they lived out their identity as part of the kingdom of God. As they lived out this identity as being citizens of heaven, there was primarily four things that separated them from the world. Those four things were this, race, poverty, sex, and life. That when it came to the early church, that the early church was first, they were sold out for racial justice. They were absolutely sold out for racial justice. Number two, they were deeply concerned about the poor and the marginalized in the society. Three, they were committed to sex being designed by God, specifically that marriage was between a man and a woman. And then four, they were for life, that is speaking up for the powerless and the vulnerable in society. That in a time and culture that was just as confused as we are today, it was the early church and their steadfast faithfulness in these four areas that spurred the gospel of Jesus from a small community in the Middle East to a worldwide movement. And I would argue that even here 2,000 years later, that when it comes to those four issues, that those are the essential issues that Christians should concern themselves when it comes to politics. That these are the things that should inform our political decisions that we are making. In fact, just this week, Pastor James and I, we recorded our Collision podcast. And in it, we talked about these four issues. 
We talked at length about them, about where we find them biblically, why they should matter to us, and if there was anything that was showing up on the ballots that we should consider in light of these four issues. And so if you're interested in that, you can go to the Collision Podcast. You can find it on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcast, it's there. But you can go deeper this week by listening to that podcast when it comes to those four issues. When it comes to those four issues, however, there is a problem for us, isn't there? And the problem is that in this society in which we live, those four issues are split politically, aren't they? That two of them feel very left-leaning and two of them feel very right-leaning. And so if these are the issues that Christians should care about, what do you do? How do you vote? Or maybe you're in a little bit different category. Maybe you're in a category a little bit like me, and I know not everybody here today is in this category, but I've heard from so many people here at Crossroads who have commented on how they don't feel like either presidential candidate really represents them, their values, or what they want in a leader in this country. I've heard from people here in this church, so many people, who have said that their vote this year, that they just simply feel like it's kind of a vote of the lesser of two evils, which if we're honest, that's a miserable place to be, isn't it? Like we are literally voting for the person most likely to cause the least amount of harm in our country. Like that is a miserable place to live as a society. And yet that's where many people feel like we're living today. Or just last week, two people reached out to me and they asked if I thought it was a sin not to vote because they could not come to a conclusion for who to vote for when it comes to the primary candidates running for president. And so if you're in any of those categories, if maybe you're a bit like me, what do you do? How do you choose when you don't know what to choose? How do you vote when you're not even really sure what to vote for? That's what we're going to talk about today. And so if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 15. That's where we're going to be today, Acts chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. We're going to put all the verses on the screen for you today. And if you don't have a Bible, but you want a Bible, we would love to give you one. That Crossroads is a generous, generous church. And we've used some of the generosity of this church in such a way to buy very nice leather-bound Bibles. And anybody who wants a Bible, all you need to do is stop by the wall that says Jesus, ask for a Bible, and we would give you one. It's, it would be an honor for for us to give you a Bible today. And so if you want a Bible, just stop by and ask for one. Now, as we get into Acts chapter 15 today, the principle that we're going to talk about is not only true of politics, but is also bigger than politics. So often we have this fear that kind of rises up in us of what if I make the wrong choice? What if I make the wrong choice? Like, I don't want to let somebody down. I certainly don't want to let God down. Like, I, I don't want to make an irreversible bad decision. And so when we find this, this fear within us, typically what we do is we hesitate, we stall, we procrastinate, we become indecisive. And in our indecis indecisiveness, we just choose not to do anything. And so what I want to do today is try to uncomplicate all of that. That today we're going to look at this one very simple spiritual principle from Acts chapter 15 and how we can apply it to so many areas of our lives, including the political part of our lives. Now, if you've never read Acts chapter 15, it's a pretty interesting story that we find in the scriptures. That some of the leaders of the church were dealing with some really complicated issues. And we had Paul and Barnabas and G, uh, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, and Peter, one of Jesus' uh, disciples, and other leaders, and they all kind of meet up in Jerusalem. They all have this meet up in Jerusalem to deal with some of the big issues facing the church. And the question that was basically before them was this, is how much of your life has to be cleaned up before you can trust Jesus? Like how good is good enough? That's the issues that they were dealing with. And the reason that all of this comes up is because Paul and Barnabas, they're missionaries, they're out doing their missionary things, and they would go into a town and Paul would preach, believe and be saved, believe and be saved, believe and be saved. And what was amazing is that people were doing it. Like they were believing in the name of Jesus and they were being saved. And so this awesome movement of the gospel is happening in all of these towns that Paul and Barnabas are going into. And so they would be there. They would kind of help with some of the leadership. They'd get a church set up. And then they would go on to the next town and they would preach that message again. Believe and be saved. Believe and be saved. Believe and be saved. Now, after Paul and Barnabas left a town, what was happening is that another group of teachers were coming in 
And they were looking at all of these new believers and they were going, like, like there's some things that you need to clean up before you can actually become one of us. Like there's some things that need to happen in your life. There's some things that you really need to do in your life before you can call yourself a Christian. And so these new believers were like, well, we're, we're confused because Paul and Barnabas is like, just believe and trust in Jesus and you'll be saved. And then these other teachers are coming in and they're telling us we got to do all these other things in order to really be a Christian. Like, what do we do? Where's it at? Like, like how good is good enough? Now, one of the things that these teachers were saying that needed to be cleaned up was actually a really huge deal. Like, in fact, we're just going to read it, and you're going to understand pretty quickly why it was such a big deal. Acts chapter 15, starting in verse 1, here's what's written for us. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. So these were the teachers that were coming in after Paul and Barnabas, and they were, here's what they were saying to these new believers. That unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Uh, <laughs> can you run that by me one more time? Yeah, unless you have a particular type of surgery, you can't be a Christian. <laughs> Paul must have missed that one because he didn't say anything about that. Like, here's what's going on. Here's what they were saying. That in order to be Christian, in order to be saved, you had to first become Jewish. And the mark of being Jew was that when male babies were born, they had this little procedure that was done and Gentile guys, unfortunately, you didn't have that procedure. So if we just get that done, we're going to be all good and you can call yourself a Christian. And so you have all these Gentile guys going like, whoa, 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 honey, I need to pray about this a little bit more before I make a decision here. Like you want to talk about something that would absolutely stop the movement of the gospel, this is it. And so here they were, these early church leaders trying to make these weighty theological decisions. This doctrinal decision that determined someone's eternal destiny, the souls of people for their, etern for their eternality. Let's just be honest. Way more important than any political election ever. Like we're talking about the eternal destiny of people's souls. And we get to see in Acts chapter 15 how they came to their conclusions. Now, as we read through their conclusion today, what I want you to do is every time you see the word seemed good, seems good, you, that's your part, all right? You get to read that. So I underlined them for you so that you get help. But anytime you see seems good, a word that's underlined, that is your part to read, all right? You got it? We good? All right, let's read it together. Here's their conclusion, verse 22. Then it, to the apostles and the elders, with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And so they sent Judas, who was called Beresabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Sicilia. Those are the guys that this is all going down. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instructions to do so. It has to us, having come to one accord to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you're gonna do okay, farewell to you. All right, so if you're keeping track here, it seemed good to choose a couple of guys to go uh, with Paul and Barnabas to Antioch. It seemed good to us to select a couple of guys, right, specifically again to go to this place. It seemed good to us in the Holy Spirit to lay upon no greater burden than these requirements. In other words, don't become a vampire, stay away from sexual immorality, and you're going to be good. It seemed right to simplify things and not raise a barrier as we invite people to follow Jesus. It seemed good. To which we go, what? I mean, come on. We're dealing with something as weighty as salvation. That we're dealing with the eternality of people's souls. 
And the best the early leaders got, the best that we've got from the who's who of Christian faith, Paul, Barnabas, Peter, James, like the best they can come up with is, it seems good to us. Like that's the best that you've got in this moment. Like if scripture doesn't specifically address a choice that you're dealing with, with the choice that you're trying to make, what do you do? Well, I could preach an entire message saying we do what seems good. We do what seems good, except for there's one problem. And that one problem is in the Old Testament, specifically in Proverbs 14, 12, where this is written to us, that there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So here's the question. How can it be that it seemed right, be right in Acts chapter 15, and it seemed right, be bad in Proverbs 14? Like, how can both of those be true? How can it be true in the scriptures that it seemed right, be right in Acts 15, and it seemed right, be bad in Proverbs chapter 14? How can that work? How can both of those be true? Well, let's start with the Old Testament. There's a way that seems right to man, but that way ultimately leads to death. Here's what that proverb is getting at. That if you're around the wrong people, listening to the wrong voices, living for excuse me, living for the wrong values, what seems right will often be wrong. Or let me say it a little bit different for you. That if you're in the wrong crowd, if you're hanging and listening to the people whose opinions differ from that of God's truth, if you're consistently following worldly values instead of biblical values, and you're surrounding yourself with people who are not close to God, then oftentimes what seems right will actually lead to something that is incredibly wrong. We've all been there, haven't we? We've all lived that proverb out in our own lives where we found ourselves running with the wrong crowd, running with the wrong influences, listening to the wrong voices, and you did something that seemed right in the moment, but later you were like, boy, man, I wish I hadn't done that. Like, I don't know. Like, just pick any situation you like. Like, becoming a Red Wing fan. That's how that happens, right? <laughs> Joking aside, we've all been there. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to the ways of death. But here we have in the New Testament, some of the giants of the New Testament going, it seems right. And then they're like, let's just build the whole foundation of the church on this. And we look at it and we go, well, how did they get there? How could Paul and James and Barnabas and Peter make such a weighty decision on something that just seemed right? In light of Proverbs 14, 12, a verse that they all undoubtedly knew. Well, Luke, the writer of Acts, actually tells us how. Oftentimes, we read through the passage in such a way that we actually miss out on the spiritual principle that's here. And so what I want to do is I'm going to go back and we're going to read some of the same verses. And this time, we're not going to focus on the word seemed right, but we're going to focus on some other words, okay? And those words are going to be underlined. So you get to play again, all right? Any of the underlined words, that's on you. Let's do this again. Verse 22, here's what it said. Then it seemed good to the and the, and the whole church. All right? Verse 25. It has seemed good to having come to one accord or one mind to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Next verse. For it has seemed good to the... And to... uh, Ooh, I missed that one. I'll get that one at 11 o'clock. Sorry. All right. Us to lay down on you no greater burdens than these requirements. All right. So if you're keeping a track, right? In other words, this wasn't something that just seemed right to one person. This seemed right to this whole group of Christians that was gathered together. It didn't just seem right to, in the second one, just didn't seem right to to one person, but, but the whole gathered church, we agreed on this. In the third example, it wasn't just seeming right to me, but not only to me, but to the Holy Spirit, that this seemed like a good place for us to move forward. In other words, there is a massive difference between something that seemed right to a man, something that seemed right to one that leads to death, And something that seems right to a community of faithful, spirit-filled followers of Jesus who have been seeking God's word and following the voice of his spirit. 
You can't miss this. And this, where, and this is where our understanding of church becomes so important. See, you don't go to church. The church is not a building. It's never been a building. The church isn't a destination. The church has always been and will always be people. The church is not a building to which you go to. It is an identity in which you embrace. That's the church. We don't go to the church. We are the church. And the church is more than just this, you know, one-hour meeting every now and then, again, on a weekend when you don't have anything else to do. The church is who we are. And so listen. When Chris or James or John or myself, when we start talking about community groups, you got to know that this isn't just another program that we want you to be a part of where we're just sitting around going, man, we just want everybody in community groups. No. That when we talk about community groups, that it's significant. Because in a, in a church as large as Crossroads, which we are closing on 4,000 people who call Crossroads home, we truly believe that community groups are the place where we find spiritual family. That every week in community groups, people come together, gathered around God's word, seeking God and his truth, praying through the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. When you start to stray, and you will because we all do, when you start to stray, it's the community the group that goes, no, 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 no. That path will lead you to death. It will kill your soul. Come back, come back, come back. And when you're in pain, it's the community group who comes alongside and prays and brings comfort. And when you see others who are struggling in the greater community, it's the community group that comes and serves. It's the community group that provides a safe place that can expose us to views that we might not normally agree with so that we can ultimately grow in the grace and love that is in Jesus. See, every Sunday night, my community group gathers together, and they are my spiritual family. They are some of my closest friends. They are my greatest counsel. It seems good to us. This wasn't a decision made in isolation based on feelings or intuition. This was the family of God gathered together, recognizing we believe that this is God's direction. That's the difference. It seems right to a person, and it leads to ways to death. But when it seems right to a community of, of faithful people seeking after Jesus, we can trust God at a whole new level. And so when it comes to politics... Here's the application I think we see out of Acts chapter 15. Is this week, when you're in your community group or whomever that group is that you call your spiritual family, that as you are seeking God in his word, that you think critically and pray through these issues, you act civilly towards those that you may not agree with, you determine what seems right, and then you go out and you vote or you don't vote in faith. That's the application. That's the application out of Acts chapter 15. That within your spiritual family, you seek God by thinking critically and praying through the issues. You act civilly towards those who you disagree with. You determine what seems right, and then you go out and you vote or you don't vote in faith. But even in that, there's a tension, isn't there? Because culturally, when it comes to politics, the whole narrative of politics in our country breeds a fear in us of the what if. Like what if even in that situation, I don't vote right? What if even in that situation, I, I, I cast a vote and it's wrong? That what if I make a decision and I can never have it back? What if democracy really has at stake? And the fear of the what if, this is where Romans 8.28 becomes so very comforting to us. Paul writes to the church in Rome these words, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purposes. It's a bit like whenever you're driving around town and you're kind of using like your Apple Maps, right? And it's telling you, take the next right, take the next right. 
And I don't know about you, but this often happens to me, particularly like when I'm going downtown and, you know, Apple Maps is like, take the next right. And I'm like, wait, there's this right right here. Is it the, like the immediately next right? Like, which next right is right? Like, which one do I go? And so, you know, you're like in this moment and you miss your turn. And then what happens? Like, what happens in that moment? Well, British Siri doesn't come on and say, you twit. Now we got to go back to the beginning, start over. No, that's not what happens. British Siri comes on and says, rerouting, rerouting your directions. And it takes you along another path to get you to your destination. In other words, Romans 8.28 is our spiritual GPS reminding us time and time again that one wrong turn isn't going to keep you off God's path. One wrong turn isn't going to keep you off of God's path. The reality is, is that every single one of us has taken wrong turns in our life. Honestly, some of us have taken way more scenic routes than others, but we have all taken wrong paths in our lives. But it's the voice of the Spirit saying, rerouting, rerouting. He's still taking you to your destination. And the good news is that our good God has a way of bringing good things even out of wrong turns. Right? I mean, that's how good he is. That God's grace is good enough to work out the wrong turns in our lives. And so how do you choose when you're not sure what choice to make? Well, biblically speaking, I think it's this. That we seek God. Can we put that slide up there? We seek God with a group of faithful, spirit-filled people. And then you do what seems right, knowing that God's grace is always big enough to work things out for his good purposes. That we come together in spirit-filled community, seeking God. Then you do what seems right, knowing that God's grace is big enough to accomplish his good purposes in my life individually, in our community as a church, in the city in which we live, in the state that we call home, in the nation that we are citizens of, that God's grace is good enough, it's good enough to work out his good purposes. And so as I wrap this up, I just wanna finalize with three things. That maybe you're here today and this is your first time or maybe you've been coming a long time. But as we've walked through this today, you've seen Jesus in a way that you've never seen Jesus before. And I would say to you today that if you look back on your life and you see all of the, the wrong turns that you've made, I wanna encourage you just for a moment that all of those wrong turns, God has rerouted to get you here today. That you're here on purpose today that the wrong turns God used to bring you here so that you have an opportunity to make a right choice in beginning a relationship with Jesus. The way that we talk about that here at Crossroads is by making Jesus your Lord and the Savior of your life. That in that we get to experience the good grace that God has for us. And if you're here today and you want to have that conversation, we would love to have that conversation with you. You can text the name of Jesus to our text number, 720-513-1933. Or any time from this point forward, you can just stop by the wall that says Jesus. And those people there, they would love to have this conversation with you. Second thing that I want to tell you is this. Is that on November 17th, we're having a patio party that's all about community groups. And on that day, you can ask questions, you can explore, you can talk to leaders, and you can get signed up if you want to be a part of a community group. We have some really cool things happening in 2025 around community groups. But if you've gone through this sermon and you've gone, you know what, I don't have that spiritual family that you're talking about. That's the opportunity for you to begin that journey of finding a spiritual family, November 17th. Final thing that I have for you, and this is just a reminder, if you wanna go deeper politically, particularly into the issues that we think Christians could be concerned with, those four issues. James and I filmed that podcast this week. It's available wherever podcasts will be found and you can listen to there. And um, if you have any problems or comments with anything that we said, I just wanna encourage you to email Pastor Chris, all right? Chris.amdahl at crossroadsabc.com, all right? All right, with that said, let's pray. And uh, before we go to communion, Jesus, uh, Lord, you are so good to us, and uh, your grace is, is so big, and we just thank you for it. 
Lord, oftentimes we end up in situations, not just politically, but all over our lives, where we're confronted with choices and decisions that we need to make that we don't know how to make them. And Lord, I pray that through Acts 15 that you would just help us, help us see this one simple principle that can help uncomplicate our lives in these scenarios. Lord, others of us, even in the midst of this, Lord, we deal with the wrong turns of our lives and the fears of what ifs. And for some of us, Lord, it's not fears, it's reality that we've made wrong decisions, we've made bad decisions. Every single one of us has found ourselves there. And Jesus, it's just so good to be reminded today that your grace is good enough to deal with the wrong turns in our lives. That the wrong turns will not lead us away from you. That in many ways, you're using them to bring us to you. And so Lord, we're grateful for that. Lord, I pray for those today, Lord, who maybe are a bit like Cassie and her story, who find themselves so far away from you, but see something in you that they desperately want. Jesus, I pray that you would whisper to them today, that they would hear your voice like a good shepherd, and that they would come running to you. Lord, we give this to you in your powerful name, the name of Jesus, amen. We come together as a church around this thing that we call communion where we remind ourselves, we remind ourselves of the unity that we share as believers. That again, our unity is not found in a certain political party, but rather in the proclamation, the belief of Jesus's death, his burial, his resurrection, and the power of him in us transforming our lives. And so we remember and we celebrate the moment that Jesus came to this earth where his body was broken for the forgiveness of our sins, where his blood was poured out so that we would have the opportunity of life that is abundant. And so today we eat and we remember and we celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. The forgiveness that we receive and the life that is ours in him. the next several minutes. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray for you. Online, you can click the button. We'll meet you there in-house. You can make your way to the banner that says prayer. And if you're here today needing prayer, maybe it's the political anxiety that's overwhelming you, we'd pray for you. If it's decisions in your life that you need to make and you just need someone to come alongside and seek God with you, we would love to do that for you. Seek the prayer that you need. I'm gonna invite you to go ahead and stand. We're gonna continue in our worship as we sing this old, old hymn together proclaiming God's goodness to us.
uh, man, what a great morning together. You know, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and for you to be here today. And we believe God's in that somehow, that, uh, that he wants you to connect with us. And we would encourage you, outside today, we're having a patio party. It's a trunk or treat. Uh, we're not all that into Halloween, but we're really into you. And we want to connect with you today. So we'd encourage you, linger, grab a Snicker bar or maybe some gummy bears, you know, whatever your thing is, and just hang out with us and uh, connect in that way. Also, if you're a teenager or if you have a teenager in your family, uh, we'd encourage you tonight from 6 to 8 o'clock, the Student Ministries is doing their blowout Halloween event. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, there's prizes for costume and all kinds of other cool, crazy things. Maybe you're driving around today and you see teenagers walking around, like throw them in the trunk and bring them here. Um, pray about it, but God might be in that. Um, but uh, we we just really want to connect with you, and that's really the point of all that. If you consider Crossroad your home church, we would love for you to be a financial partner in the things that God is doing in and through this church. And you can give one of three ways. You can go to the Crossroads website. You can download the Crossroads app, or you can uh, give through one of the black kiosks on your way out today. Um, well, gosh, it's such a beautiful day, and God's goodness, uh, just as we spend time out there, and whatever you do this afternoon, so we want to send you with a blessing. So if you raise your hands together, let me read this over us. May we be filled with the spirit of reverence and honor for all, cherishing our bonds with the family of faith. May the grace of the Lord be with us always guiding our steps, and illuminating our path. And all my friends said, amen. amen. Awesome. Hey, we'll see you guys outside.